Welcome to my series of programmes which I am calling Standing on the Shoulders of Giants where you'll get to hear about some of the unsung heroes of astronomy. So let's get started. What are stars? In the late 1800s astronomers had a pretty good idea. Stars were clearly bright balls of gas scattered throughout the Milky Way. In the 1930s, people had begun measuring distances to the stars and found that they were very luminous indeed, releasing impressive amounts of energy. Some stars appeared to come in pairs, but what this meant for those stars was still unclear. Nobody was quite sure how stars formed or what happened to them during their presumably long lives. Some odd stars also seemed to vary in their brightness, and astronomers hadn't yet managed to explain why. Another long-standing mystery concerned what stars were made of. Researchers had observed signs of the same elements found on Earth, so most astronomers simply assumed that the stars shared roughly the same chemistry as our own planet. We also had a serious problem. There were so many of them. How could we possibly study them all? There was no classification scheme for stars, and without an orderly approach, how could we ever learn more about how stars worked, or what they were made of? Observations were also revealing that there were more than just stars to be studied. Faint scraps of glowing gas, strange spiral nebulae, and tight clusters teeming with stars all suggested that there were many more astronomical mysteries hidden in the data that would need to be disentangled. With heaps of data coming in from impressive new telescopes and with relatively few professional astronomers on staff and limited funds even at the world's best observatories, how could we possibly begin to address all these problems? The solution came from Edward Pickering, director of the Harvard College Observatory, which ultimately led to the creation of the Harvard Computers, an undeniable force of scientific analysis, classification and discovery. However, at the turn of the 20th century, the engine of discovery didn't come in the form of computational or electronic machines. The Harvard Computers were women. Near the end of the 19th century, Edward Prickering was frustrated. He needed a large and skilled staff of assistants to analyse and classify the heaps of data being generated by the best telescopes of the day, and he was displeased with the work of the men in his employment, known as computers, people who did mathematical cal calculations. Legend has it that Pickering once scoffed that his maid could do a better job than the men who worked for him. Pickering then backed up the statement by hiring his maid as a computer. In truth, the story isn't quite as simple. Pickering's maid, Wilhelmina Fleming, had worked as a teacher in Scotland and acquired a natural scientific curiosity from her father. Pickering's wife, Elizabeth, Recognising that Fleming's talents extended beyond housework and encouraged her husband to hire her at Harvard. Pickering was also a supporter of the idea that women could find work as scientists. It has also helped that women could be hired for much lower wages than men, allowing them to employ a larger staff with the same funds. Wilhelmina Fleming soon became one of the founding members of the Harvard Computers, an all-female group that analysed the cutting-edge telescope data of the day. At the time, the best data from telescopes was quite literally cutting-edge. Images were captured from the telescopes on thin glass plates, treated on one side with a chemical emulsion that reacted to light. Carefully prepared plates would be loaded into a telescope's camera in darkness and then exposed, with the emulsion darkening as the light hit it to capture the data gathered by the telescope. After exposure, the plates were painstakingly developed and then carefully stored in envelopes, protected from light and moisture and even fingerprints to be studied and analysed later on. The astronomical data these glass plates were gathering could be broadly sorted into two different categories. 
Imaging and spectroscopy. Imaging is precisely what it sounds like. Two-dimensional data of stars and galaxies on a given night. These images could record the relative location of a star in the night sky. Preserve how bright the star appeared to be on a, a given night. Or capture the appearance of a glowing nebula. In Pickering's day, images were especially exciting when they captured the same stars night after night, carefully tracking the star's brightness to monitor how it changed over time. Astronomers at the time knew that some stars were variable, and analysing images of these stars from subsequent nights seemed key to studying how they changed with time. Spectroscopy, by contrast, does not record a picture of an astronomical object. Instead, it preserves the colours of light that the star emits. In spectroscopic data, light from an object is split and sorted according to its colour, or wavelength, by bouncing it through a prism or off a microscopically ruled surface. If you have a DVD handy, you can see a great everyday example of this by turning the disc over and seeing the rainbow effect produced by light bouncing off the tiny grooves. A telescope recording spectroscopic data would direct the bluest light with the shortest wavelength to one end of a photographic plate and the reddest light with the longest wavelength to the other, with intermediate wavelengths neatly sorted in the middle, like a rainbow. Splitting the light like this and measuring how much light we detect at each wavelength gives us an astronomical object spectrum. A spectrum is especially valuable because of what it can tell us about an object's chemistry. Light absorbed or emitted by specific molecules or atoms has a very precise known wavelength. A star with lots of hydrogen in its atmosphere, for example, would show a dark stripe in the yellowish region of the spectrum, where photons of that wavelength were being absorbed by hydrogen atoms. Another star with ionised calcium in its atmosphere would display a trio of dark lines in the red spectrum, and so on. An expert spectroscopic analyst, like a Harvard computer, could read the spectrum of a star, a bright streak interspersed with dark lines from absorbing elements like a fingerprint. Wilhelmina Fleming proved to be an exceptionally talented analyst, Working with imaging data, she discovered dozens of variable stars and nebulae, including the famous Horsehead Nebula, and the first observation of a star known as a white dwarf, the tiny, incredibly dense core remnant of a star like our sun that's left behind after its death. Fleming also worked extensively with Harvard spectroscopic data. She began developing a method of classifying the hundreds of thousands of stars in their data set according to their spectra, identifying stars based on how strong the dark lines from hydrogen atoms absorbing light appeared to be, and sorting the stars into classes donated by letters. The strongest hydrogen absorption lines belonging to the A spectral type, the second strongest to the B type, and so on, down to type O stars with visible helium lines but very weak hydrogen lines. Fleming's work on stars and their spectral types came early in the years of the Harvard computers, when we understood very little about how stars worked. Still, her research laid an important foundation for the groundbreaking work of the other Harvard computer, Annie Jump Cannon. Annie Jump Cannon was born in Delaware in 1863, with an early interest in astronomy encouraged by her mother, Mary. Cannon attended Wesley College to study physics and astronomy, and also developed a strong interest in photography. While in college, she also survived scarlet fever, an illness that left her almost entirely deaf. Cannon joined the Harvard Computers in 1896 and quickly became one of the fastest classifiers of stellar spectrum on the team. 
In the end, she classified over 350,000 stars during her career. She also quickly got involved in the ongoing question on how to classify stellar spectra. Other computers had identified many more dark absorption lines in the stellar spectra and speculated about devising new and complex classification schemes, but Cannon combined these new line identifications with the clear and simple system that Wilhelmina Fleming had devised, classifying stars according to their spectral line strengths. Cannon's insight was to rearrange the classification system's order and to base it on a broader set of lines from multiple multiple elements. Cannon's key insight was to rearrange the classification system's order and to base it on a broader set of lines from multiple elements. At the time, astronomers still weren't quite sure what caused the variations in stellar spectra. Speculations included age, temperature, or their fundamental chemical composition. Cannon's classification system moved the O stars with their clear helium lines to the top of the list, followed by B and then A. Stars as the hydrogen lines got stronger and stronger. These were followed by four more categories in roughly alphabetical order, composites of several of Fleming's classes. The order of the classes was also based on another discovery of Cannon's. The stellar types appeared to follow a continuous progression, with some stars appearing halfway between the O and B types, or between the K and M types. In the end, any jump Cannon's spectral type system fell into order as O, B, A, F, G, K, M with subtypes to indicate exactly where in the sequence a star might fall. Our sun example would be considered a G2 type star. The arrangements for these spectral classes may seem a bit haphazard, but in truth it's anything but. Today astronomers organise stars on what's known to be the Hertzsprung-Russell, or HR diagram, named after Danish astronomer Einar Hertzsprung and American astronomer Henry Norris Russell. On the HR diagram we plot a star's effective temperature, the temperature it appears to have in its atmosphere or outermost layers against its luminosity, a measure of how much energy the star is emitting, which can be determined based on its relative brightness and distance. If we plot a large collection of stars from all over the sky on this diagram, they fall into a consistent and clear distribution, with the majority of stars tracing along a diagonal. We know today that these stars comprise what's called the main sequence. Marking the brightness and the temperature of a star is born with different initial masses and fusing hydrogen in their cores. Later in their lives, stars like our Sun, with relatively low masses, will cool off and expand after about 10 billion years on the main sequence, becoming red giants and drifting up and to the right of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram as they switch from fusing hydrogen to fusing helium. Higher mass stars, marked at the top of the diagram, also cool off and expand after only 10 million years, exhausting their supply of hydrogen much faster and moving straight to the right of the diagram. None of this was known when Annie Jump Cannon first created her classification scheme, but her method of identifying spectral lines along a continuum in these stars proved brilliant. If we add Cannon spectral types O, B, A, F, G, K and M to the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, we can see where they fall along the horizontal axis. They fall perfectly into order. Cannon's system, years before the surface temperature of the stars were studied in detail, had perfectly traced this elusive stellar property. Annie Jump Cannon's classification scheme was adopted by the International Astronomical Union in 1922 and it is still used today. Cannon also became the first woman to receive an honorary
Doctorate of Science from Oxford. In 1933, she created the Annie Jump Cannon Prize, awarded annually by the American Astronomical Society to recognise the outstanding research and promise by a young female astronomer. The Cannon Prize is still awarded today to young women astronomers. The first recipient of this prize, Cannon's personal selection, happened to be another young Harvard astronomer, Cecilia Payne Kaposkin. Cecilia Payne arrived at Harvard in 1923. Travelling from England after completing her studies in physics, chemistry and astronomy at Cambridge University, she had not been officially granted a degree. Cambridge didn't begin awarding degrees to women until 1948, and she left the United Kingdom in the hopes of pursuing a professional scientific career. At Harvard, Payne began studying the relationship between the spectral classes of stars assigned by Annie Jump Cannon to the star's physical properties. She was especially interested in stars' temperatures and compositions. Three years earlier, Indian physicist Magnad Saha had made an exciting discovery. Born in Shororatali, Italy, to a Boer family, Saha rose to prominence in India after studying first at Dhaka College and then at the Presidency College of Calcutta. Saha was working in Calcutta when he discovered the exciting connection between temperature and the elements seen in the stellar spectrum. The equation that he created, which now bears his name, linked the ionisation state of various elements to the temperature of the gas that these elements were in. Saha's reasoning went something like this. A hotter gas would produce more high-energy photons, a result known as black-body radiation, originally discovered by physicist Max Planck. Those energetic photons would in turn collide with the electrons in the atom's gaseous state, exciting those electrons until they were ejected from the atom entirely. The loss of an electron left behind a positively charged atom known as an ion, and these hot ionised gases would have very different spectral signatures than the cooler non-ionised gases. Saha computed mathematical formulas that predicted these different lines would appear in a spectrum as a function of temperature but his work invoked temperatures far too high to be achieved in a laboratory. Instead, he turned to the stars and found his predictions matched the appearance of the spectral types in Annie Jump Cannon's classification scheme. The O stars, with ionised helium in their spectra, appeared to be the hottest, followed by the B stars and so on down to the relatively cool M stars. Cecilia Payne used Sahar's equations as a starting point for her doctoral thesis at Harvard, convinced that she could identify spectral lines and mathematically describe their intensity. She could develop a system for precisely measuring the temperatures of the stars. Beginning with the O stars, she detected ionising silicone in the stars' atmospheres and calculated that the stars must be extremely hot, with surface temperatures around 25,000 degrees Kelvin, or over 44,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Her work continued down through the full range of canon spectral types, establishing the first temperature scale for stars based on their classifications and spectral appearances. Still, Payne pushed her work further. The strength of a spectral line in a star can depend on many things. One is temperature, but the abundance of the elements that is absorbing light is also important. A star with very little silicone, for example, may display only weak absorption from silicone or even none at all, simply because there aren't any atoms in the star to do the absorbing yet the silicone is there, comprising part of the star. In addition to measuring temperature, P 
Payne wanted to measure the relative abundance of the elements in stars. In short, she literally wanted to determine what stars were made of. Her results proved controversial at first, but astronomers of the time, including Henry Norris Russell of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, assumed that stars must have roughly the same composition as the Earth elements, such as silicon, oxygen, aluminium and calcium, had all been seen in stellar spectra, and those elements were common on Earth. It made for a nice neat picture of star and planet formation to assume that all of these objects had similar com compositions. Payne's research suggested something else. Most of the heavy elements in the periodic table seem to have similar abundances in stars and on Earth, but the two lightest elements, hydrogen and helium, were wildly different. Hydrogen, in fact, appeared to be a million times more abundant in stars than it was here on Earth. Payne included this result in her thesis, but was discouraged from trusting her results by other astronomers such as Russell. She included a caveat in her write-up that the hydrogen abundance was almost certainly not real. Still, even with this qualification, her results were explosive. Payne had discovered that all stars had very similar compositions, all with similar abundances of heavy elements and with seemingly huge amounts of hydrogen and helium. Payne concluded that any jump cannon spectral type sequence was entirely driven by stellar temperature and was almost completely independent of variations in element abundance. Payne's thesis was widely lauded as brilliant work. She became the first person to receive a PhD in astronomy from Harvard. She went on to spend the rest of her academic career at Harvard studying varying stars with her husband and fellow astronomer Sergei Kapushkin and generating an enormous catalogue of variable stars still that is used today. At age 76 she received an award for lifetime career eminence from the American Astronomical Society. Ironically, the award is dubbed the Henry Norris Russell Lectureship, named for the very astronomer who had originally disbelieved Payne's greatest discovery. Today we know that Celia Payne's discovery was correct. The stars, and indeed most of the universe, is composed almost entirely of hydrogen. In our own Milky Way, hydrogen makes up 75% of normal matter. Helium comprises another 23%, leaving just 2% for all the heavier elements in the entire periodic table. Payne's research paved the way for several other incredible discoveries on the chemistry and evolution of stars. Payne and her contemporaries recognised that the time of their work was focused on the outer layers of the stars, where light was able to escape from the star's interior and reach Earth with the stellar atmosphere's chemical fingerprints preserved in its spectrum. However, the deep inner workings of a star, including the source of their luminous energy churning away in their cores, would remain a mystery until 1938. That year, nuclear physicist Hans Bethe used the chemical composition of the stars, now widely accepted to consist mainly of hydrogen and helium, with small amounts of heavier elements, to devise a new theory for nuclear reactions in stellar cores that would generate heavier elements and explain how the stars shone. Bethe was awarded the 1967 Nobel Prize for his research. Payne's research also highlighted how stars impact the chemistry of their surroundings. Thanks to the speed of light, fixed at roughly 186,000 miles per second, peering at distant galaxies in the universe is like looking back in time. When we observe a galaxy 1 billion light years away, we're seeing light that was emitted 1 billion years ago in an earlier era of our universe. Since Celia Payne's discovery, we found the relative abundance of heavy elements in our universe has increased with time. 
This is in consequence of that adage made popular by astronomer Carl Sagan and singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell that we are all made of star stuff. This discovery actually originated with four astronomers, Margaret Burbridge, Geoffrey Burbridge, William Fowler and Fred Hoyle, who hypothesised in 1957 that many heavy elements were synthesised deep inside stars by nuclear reactions, and that this process dictated the chemical enrichment of the universe. Under this theory, the early universe would have had few heavy elements simply because fewer generations of stars had lived and produced heavier elements via fusion in their cores, which they then eject when exploding or colliding with other stars. Fowler later received a Nobel Prize for his work in 1983. It's telling that none of the women who carried out this foundational research were recognised with a Nobel Prize for their work. Magnat Zaha was also repeatedly nominated for a Nobel Prize for his work connecting stellar temperatures and their spectra, but was never chosen as a recipient. Still, Fleming and Cannon created the elegant stellar classification scheme that's used today. Pain revolutionised our understanding of stellar temperatures and composition, and many women in the years since, including a number of Annie Jump Cannon's prize winners, have indelibly shaped our picture of the stars. We'll be learning more about the physics of stars in future programmes, thanks to the seeds planted by the Harvard computers and other early pioneers of stellar astronomy. In the next programme, we'll focus on the amazing discovery of another Harvard computer, Henrietta Swan Livet, and how her research laid the groundwork for observations that would forever alter our understanding of the universe.